Hey, good morning everyone. Welcome to the third tutorial. Um, today it's a nice mixture between some some practice, some theory, uh, not so much coding today. So, last week we had like the NER exercise, the named entity recognizer. And did someone try to implement also the, or adding the capitalization information, the casing information into the model? Someone tried that? Nope. Okay, but you can find the solution online just to show you how you can do it in with uh, Keras. It's quite straightforward. So what we need for the beginning is like um, we have first like an array with our word indices, and then we need a second matrix with like the case information. So we, we adapted our pre-processing. So here it creates a NumPy array with case information. And here we have like, we have like an, an, a list, an array, a matrix for the word indices. And the same we get for the case indices where we have like a function get casing, which gives us the casing for word. So here we have the word and then we can say, okay, it's ether. So no define casing. Or it's like, is it a digit? Is it lower or lower or upper? Initial upper. And we just return like the case information. So which of the cases is it? And to implement this in Keras, so what you need to change is here we get now a train matrix, a matrix with the word indices and a matrix with the case information and the label for the training. And what we model is we have a model for the words, which is like an embedding matrix with the word embeddings. And we do the same with like for the casing. So we define a model for the casing where we have like a single layer. If we can say we have a fixed layer. If we have like one fixed embeddings for the layer, or we can also update it during a training where we then just select the embedding matrix. And our final model uses then the merge operation which merges the words and the casing, adds like uh, a dense layer, a hidden layer, a softmax layer, and then we can run uh, our program on the SGD. So we can compile it, we can train it, and for training we say model.fit and we input train x and train case x as the two inputs of our model. So train x was the word indices for the first model, and with the case indices for the second model, and as an output we get the case, uh, the information. So if you have like different features, for example, you want to add like also part of speech into your model, you would just define like a third model, and then for every th model you can define what do you want to do. So typically you just do an embedding, but you can also do like more complex stuff on every part. And at some point you out uh, merge the output for all the models. Okay, last week we had the question, what does the intermediate layers learn and can we derive some meaningful interpretation out of it? In computer vision, you can really nice visualize what the intermediate layers are learning. So Lee published in 2009 a paper where he trained a deep uh, neural network for object image object recognition. So here he, he trained it on face images. And in computer vision, you do not take the complete image into account like you just take smaller subparts of the image. So for example, only nine times nine pixels of it into account, and then you do a convolutional layer. But that's some details we will cover next week. And what you can visualize what the different neurons learn. So here we have like, I think these are 24 neurons for the first thin layer. And everyone is trained on like nine times nine pixel image. And then you can visualize what does this neuron, this single neuron learn. And this single neuron responds to an image patch where you have an edge. So you have here some dark color and then it goes over to some bright color. This neuron responds to like a black patch, this one to a white patch. And then you have like here a horizontal edge from white to black. Here you have like from black to white. 
then these neurons are mapped to like to the next hidden layer, the second hidden layer, and then you can also visualize what is the second hidden layer learning. So here you see, okay, this one is learning or to de detect an eye. Here you can see its nose, mouth, nose again. And then these are like mapped to the third hidden layer, and the third hidden layer learns to detect different faces. So here we see some female faces here, like male face with mustache. And um, this is like automatically learned by the neurons. So no one was sitting there programming. I want to write like an edge detector or I want to de write um, an eye detector, nose detector, but the network figured it out by itself and um, got to this representation that when you want to detect faces, it's a really good first step to detect edges, then to detect like parts, eye, nose, mouth, and then in the final layer to detect the whole face. Doing this for words is a bit more difficult, uh, especially when you have also like the dense vector representation in between. But for images, it's really nice and really straightforward and you can find a lot of these representations. Maybe when someone is interested, you can also try to do the same representation for words, which would be like a nice, interesting research question. How can you visualize what the intermediate layers are learning in a deep neural network when you use it on uh, sentences or in document level. Okay, warm up question. There are sadly no screws in my laptop, so that's not the stable installation. Warm up question. Um, you have the task of co reference resolution. So you have a text and you have different entities and pronouns in the text, and you want to establish or identify all entities and pronouns which reference to the same entity. So you have a text, Obama visits Illinois, he gives a talk, and the president uh, was invited 2012, the last time to Illinois, for example. And you want to identify if these are the different chains. And you can model this as a binary classification task. So you look at two pairs, so two mentions or two pronouns, and you try to establish, do they refer to the same uh, entity, yes or no? And is someone willing to say, okay, how could you create a neural network for this? How could it look like? How would you model it? So someone likes to take a pen and draw on the flip chart for it. So you know the entities in advance, mm -hmm. and then you try to you give your input or combinations of two into the model, and then you just try, is it the same entity or is it referring to the same entity or not? So is Obama and the president referring to the same person in this text? And you can use deep forward networks, really similar to the network we presented last time for named entity recognition, part of speech, and so on. So, someone, yeah, well, so you want to draw? Not yet. Uh, Not yet, you, okay. What if, you take the, what if you take the context of one entity, and get embeddings of that, and concatenate it with the others, like context of the other entity, with some context, put into one vector, and feed it into, uh, it would be like an input layer, then do some time events, and probably those two layers, sigmoid, uh, sorry, softmax at the end, and get this or not. Okay, yeah, that's a really good start. So how could we improve this model? So basically you say... I can't use back of words basically. Uh, so you have context one, context two. Something like this. Well, some hidden layers. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, how could we improve this model, or what's like what could be an issue with this model? How do we detect um, the of the, I mean, 
there are the same elements. Maybe we can take some vectors similar, a uh, distance of the vectors, I don't know, at some uh, in the end. Some distance, okay. So distance is good word, but not completely correct yet. Any ideas? Further ideas? Random ideas you have in your mind? So yeah, you have entities and pronouns as an input. So when I understood you correctly, you put in the entity and pronouns and the context of it. You know, like the word embeddings and then input it. Okay, so there are some more tricks. Um, so there's a paper from the Kevin Clark. So it's not a published paper, but it was a class project in CS224D, the Richard Zocher class. And it's, so what you do is like you have your mention one and <coughs> mention two, and you take the word embedding for mention one. So you take the word embedding for Obama and you take the word embedding for president. And then you have some context information, so maybe the words to the left, the words to the right, you also put it into. And then you have some mention relating features. So for example, what is the distance between the words? So how what are like how many tokens or how many sentences are apart? So when you I don't know, when you have Obama in the beginning of the sentence and he is like ten pages later it's not so likely that Obama and he are relating to the same person, but when he is like re occurring in the next sentence, it's more likely. So you have the mention itself, you have the context and how, what's the distance between them. You do embedding lookup, input it to a hidden state, maybe a second hidden state, and then you get to do a probability, so a zero one probability or probability between zero and one that these could refer these two mentions could refer to the same entity and yet then you can just use pro back propagation train this model so this is like on two contexts what you can also then well this is like the first step what you can do is like then for every pair you can establish a probability that this pair could refers to the same person and what we want to do is like typically a chain and co-reference resolution. So we want to find all mentions which are referring to one person. And you can use like clustering. So you have like your pairs and for every pair you have the information. Are they um, co-referring to the same person? And then he also describes a, class, a merging of clustering or how you can establish should I merge two clusters. So I found one pair and another pair and are these co-referring to the same person? So should I merge the two clusters? And here he inputs every mention in the clusters, get some hidden state, some dense vector using a max pooling operation, which will be introduced next week. So which looks, okay, what is like the highest probability over them or the highest dense vector value? Then some other hidden state and then he gets a probability of if the merge is good or not. So should we merge these two clusters or is it like two different, referring to diff, two different person? And then you can use this iteratively to get from um, binary pairs to like your chain of co-references in the sentence. And that's how you can model your complete co-reference resolution system. He gets really good accuracy. It's not state of the art, but it's also not like, not so it was like class project from a student, so it's not uh, research, but it's really good. And I think I, I really like the illustration in this paper. Questions on that? Can you please say anything to two sentences for computing similarity? Sorry, say again. Mm. I'm saying given two sentences. Yeah. And you can compute similarity using the same word. You, you can compute also the similarity the same way. It's a question how you model like this. So how do you do the mapping from sentence to the vector space? Because like sentence can be, um, has a variable length, but you typically only work with like fixed layers. So how you do that, we will learn one trick today, how you can work on sentences. Another trick is next week on convolution neural networks. Well, we can also see how can we can compute it. 
Okay, recommended readings for today. We're going to talk about autoencoders, about recursive neural networks. So there are two papers from Richard Socher, which are really nice. And there's a good video from Hinton on autoencoders and pre-training. So Hinton is like the grandfather of deep, uh, deep learning with his paper in 2006. He started the deep learning trend. And the video is also really interesting because he talks about sex and Al-Qaeda and what you can learn from sex and Al-Qaeda for deep learning and how you can map these concepts to deep learning and make your predictions better. I hope this raises your interest into watching this video because I will not tell you what he is talking about that in this. But it's a nice video. Okay, so what is an autoencoder? Autoencoder is a learning algorithm. So some people say it's unsupervised, some people say it's supervised, some people say it's semi-supervised, depending how you define these words. So it's a learning algorithm. And it's, re it's really simple to understand and it looks really stupid in the beginning. So given you have some input x, I don't know, the pixels of your image, you pass your input, your pixels of the image to a hidden state and then you try to reconstruct your input. So you have your input, let's say you have six pixels, you reduce it to three hidden neurons, and then you try to reconstruct your six pixels. Um, the simplest form of it is a feedforward network where the hidden size is smaller than the input size. And we search for parameters such that the reconstruction here is about the same as our input. And the error function, we can take the mean squared error, so how big is the difference between the input and the reconstruction. And once we're finished with training this, so you train it also with stuff with spec propagation uh, as every other network, uh, we're interested in this representation in the middle. So I hope it's clear how it works in principle. And now I try to explain to you why this is a smart thing and not a totally stupid thing. So everyone got it, how it works? So the idea is you have some representation in your data. When you generate randomly an image, you get something like this. So you can generate one million images and there will be no real meaningful image in it. So you generate randomly one million images and it will all be noise. Getting an image like this is like really, really unlikely. The chances maybe, I don't know, one in a trillion. So it never happens. So we have like this really huge space of possibilities. So when you think of it, this of like a dimensional space of, I don't know how many pixels are there. Let's say that's 40,000 pixels or 400,000 pixels. Uh, you have a really high dimensional space and getting some meaningful representation by this is quite rare. So what does it mean when you work on real images taken by a camera? Is that there's some hidden or latent structure in it. So, um, so for example, we have like soft edges, so we have uh, patches with like a lot of color in it, so which are dark or bright. And what we do with autoencoders, we produce a compressed representation of a high dimensional input. So when you have an image of 1,000 times 1,000 pixels, uh, it's like a one-dimensional space. But in the one-dimensional space, the number of meaningful images, the number of real images, is like really, really small. The compression is lossy, so this, so we cannot store all information in our hidden state, but we can only store some information in our hidden state. And learning drives the encoder to be good compression in particular for training examples. So when we present images 1,000 times 1,000 pixels to our learning, to our autoencoder, it learns, okay, what are like the structure of my images? For random input, the, reconst uh, the reconstruction error will be high, but like for real images, it will be really low. And the autoencoder learns to abstract properties from the input, so it learns what is the structure of like a real image. And this can make further representation, uh, further classification much easier because then you do not train on a one-dimensional space, but you train maybe only on a 100-dimensional space. So when you reduce the 1 million input pixels to 100 hidden state, uh, this makes classification a lot easier. So one example is on the MNIST example. And um, here they 
trained it on the pixels it's only 784 86 dimension input reduce it to two dimensions and we see that similar numbers pixels uh, pixels of similar are in a or close in the space so here we see all the fives here we see all the ones here we see all the twos and now drawing like classifying or classify these images into classes which is really simple for a human we could just draw some lines and get quite okay accuracy on image recognition you can also put it in more like scientific way and scientific measuring there's a really nice paper why does unsupervised pre-training help deep learning which is a really good read on it what he did is he tested um, the MNIST handwritten digit uh, data set computed error errors so here we see it was one hidden layer and he has without pre-training so pre-training I will come in a moment. So pre-training is applying outer encoders first to input the image of the handwritten digit and then try to reconstruct and then use this as a first step. And you see without pre-training, the error rate is around here. So it's 1.3 and here it's like lower, it's this like two. So this is lower error rate, error rate of zero and pre-training helps and you have this especially in deep neural networks so when you do not apply pre-training in a deep neural network you get like really high error rate and also an error rate which is not superior to like uh, in a network with only a single layer but when you apply pre-training with outer encoders you can decrease the error rate and that's also what Hinton presented in his 2006 papers he applied for the first time pre-training with outer encoders or kind of outer encoders and this uh, was like the crucial breakthrough in deep learning and learning training deep neural networks. So outer encoders is kind of similar to PCA principal component analysis or LSA. Um, so in PCA <coughs> we convert a set of correlated variables to the principal components. The problem with PCA it can only capture linear correlations. So any nonlinear relations in your data cannot be captured with PCAs. <coughs> and what Hinton does show in his presentation, so he took the Reuters corpus of news articles and reduced it to, or used the most common terms in it and reduced it. And with LSA, we get an output like this. But when he applied also a deep outer encoder and he got an output like this. So here we can see all accounts or earnings articles. Here we have articles on energy markets. Here we have like legal documents, which gives us a really nice clustering of similar documents because in a document, you have really a lot of non-linear correlations in it. Any questions on that? So I hope we all agree that outer encoders could be good. Um, the question is how do we ensure that the outer encoder is not learning the identity function? So learning the identity function would not be helpful. So in our sec example, if we just put six hidden layers here, the reconstruction would be really easy. So the first neuron would learn the value of the first input, the second neuron would learn the value of the second input, and then we get like zero reconstruction. But learning the identity function is nothing really helpful. So there are different ways how you can avoid this. Uh, the first one is the bottleneck constraint. So the hidden layer is much smaller than the input layer. So you have like one million pixels as input and you uh, constrain it to like 1000 hidden layers. So it needs to do a reduce from 1 million input to 1,000. Then there's a sparse encoding where you force many hidden units to be zero or near zero. And there's a denoising encoder. So you add randomness to the input and or to the hidden values. So there's the denoising encoder. So you create some random noise and the random noise is added to every neuron. And then you try to reconstruct this error. 
Alternative implementation is that you just dump, for example, 50% of the hidden state. So you do your encoder, go from the input to the hidden state, and then you just delete 50% of the hidden, and then you it must be reconstruct from like only half of the hidden states. Is it like a dropout layer or is it different? It's a dropout layer. <coughs> So this one is really easy to implement, bottleneck constraint. The dropout layer, or denoising a code is kind of similar to dropout layer. Dropout layer where you delete 50% of the hint states is really cool. Uh, I was totally amazed when I read on this on Friday or Thursday. And I will explain you the math later in the third part of this lecture, why it's really, really interesting concept. And the most people use like a dropout layer for autoencoders. What we can also do is like to stack autoencoders. So we start with like our input, our first in layer, and then we try to reconstruct the input. And we can this of course stack for several times and we will run it layer wise. So we start with like our input, our first hidden layer, and then the reconstruction of the input. We train it until we are satisfied with the results. And then we go on, we say, we keep our hidden state this fixed and input it as an uh, input to the next outer encoder. So here we have more abstract features, representations, and we try to reconstruct it. And this is how we can stack uh, arbitrarily many documents. So in the second step, we try to re or compute the reconstruction error between our predicted hidden value one and the actual hidden value one. And this how we can train arbitrarily deep neural networks with outer encoders. After that, you do some fine tuning. So um, when you train every layer of your hidden layers, you do some fine tuning so you can apply the backpropagation to the complete deep outer encoder, where you input your value and try to reconstruct. So for example, you have three encoders making the hidden layers smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you try to reconstruct it. <coughs> or you can do some fine tuning, so you have a classification task, for example, the, uh, the label for your, for your images of the ditches, and you, you just apply a softmax layer as the last layer, and then you do normal supervised training on that. So to give you an example, we start with six inputs, we reduce it to four hidden layers, <coughs> and you train an outer encoder to get the first weight, so to get this weight matrix and the first bias vector, so which is like uh, depicted here, and then you try to reconstruct it, and after a certain number of steps, iterations, you stop, you neglect this information, this decoder here, this is called, the first part is the encoder, this is the decoder, and you just dump it. Sorry. What, what kind of function is in the open layer? Is it like time interpolators or some like standard ones? Yeah, so uh, you usually depends what, what is, how is your values encoded, but you can use tangent superpolators, but the output of it can only be between minus one and one, so when you put, I don't know, 10,000 in here, yeah. you cannot reconstruct it in a meaningful way. So when the input should also be between minus one and one or between zero and one. But good question. And after some time, you're, you're happy with the results. So you, you start a new autoencoder, take your output for the first hidden state, uh, train the weight matrices here, try to reconstruct it, train it as before. And after some iterations, you said, okay, my loss function is small enough, I will converge to the next layer. And then you can say, okay, now you have the hidden layer two, and you train your self-max classifier, and you compute, okay, here you have three classes, uh, class zero, class one, class two, and you can train pre-train your softmax layer. And then you can do the fine tuning, so you start with your actual input, map it to the first hidden layer, map it to the second hidden layer, map it to the softmax classifier, and then do backpropagation over all the input.
questions? So the whole idea is here that, that you, mm -hmm. that you s uh, set up the... So for learning end to end, you have a better, you have better uh, uh, weights for the, for the neurons as a starting point for the combination. Correct. So does it make a huge difference? We will come to it on the next slide. If it makes huge difference, it sounds very complicated and it's really annoying to implement. Uh, because like here you have like one, one tr first training, second training, third training, and then the complete is the fourth training. So you have four training iterations and you need to see, okay, how many iterations do I need and it takes <coughs> some time. So how important is it? And is pre-training really necessary? So Hinton presented in his 2006 paper the idea of pre-training, which was like the breakthrough in deep learning. And Glorut and Bengio presented in 2010 in the paper Understanding the Difficulty of Training Deep Feed Forward Neural Networks, um, a different initialization function and different activation function. So you see maybe in Keras how we can initialize a dense layer with like using the Glorut function which was presented here in their paper. And they worked also on the MNIST handwritten digit data set at training different networks. So here up here we see a sigmoid with depth five. So they use five hidden layers and use the sigmoid function and it's not learning anything. So sigmoid function is really bad. It was also discovered in their paper that sigmoid function is really bad and you use, should use the tangent parabolic function because the mean value of the sigmoid is 0.5. The mean value of the tangent function is zero, which is much nicer. When you use the sigmoid function with depth four, you have really high error rate and then it starts slowly to, to, to decrease. When you just change the activation function to the tangent function it's and not changing anything else, you get a really good or get a lot better or a lot lower error rate on that. <coughs> then he also did some soft sign function, which is similar to the tangent function, but it's a bit easier to compute. It's not really used. I would say it's not really common. But then he try, presented different Normalization vector uh, methods. So the, he presented a new way how to initialize the weights, which is called here n. And we see, okay, when you use the tangent function with the right normalization, you get quite a low error rate. Oh, sorry, it's not on the MS data set, it's on a different data set. And you get quite a low error rate, and when you compare it, so here you have like an error rate of 15% compared to 90% when you use the sigmoid function but it's still a bit higher than the, with the pre-training. But with the right activation function and normalization, the importance of pre-training decreases. And I think in the most recent papers, you usually, people do not apply pre-training that much. Yeah. Yes. So if I understand that correctly, if I follow this um, way of constructing the network, um, then the layers always get smaller, right? Because otherwise I run this bottleneck problem. So, yeah, you want to run, so you can either run, you want to make them smaller to have the bottleneck problem. So you want to force the network that it's not doing the easy job and learning the identity function, but it learns the relations, what are the important relations in my data. But is that really common that all the layers get smaller towards the end or? It's it's really common yeah. to do this, yeah. Typically, you start with a big layer, and then it gets smaller, so that you can learn more abstract information on that, more abstract representation of your data. So you start with really simple for the computer vision, for example, detecting edges in your data, and then some in a really deep layer you can detect whole faces or you can detect cats or you can detect that, cars. That was exactly what I was wondering because if I have one layer um, which detects edges, there are mm. not so many combinations of edges. I mean there are mm. edges like that, edges like that mm. and all that stuff but yeah. there are not so many. Yeah. But when it comes to more complex mm. structures like eyes and ears mm. and something like that, 
then I think it would make sense to have a bigger layer with these. Mm -hmm. So in computer vision, they use something which is called convolutionary networks, which is covered next week. So you start typically on a really small patch. So like, for example, nine times nine pixels, and you scan with the patch over it. And this gives you then some, for example, 9,000 dimensions for the different patches. So you have only small input, nine times nine pixels, but because you have so many different patches, the hidden layer gets bigger. And then you combine different patches. So you take, for example, you increase it, you go from nine to nine pixels, you go to three times three patches. So it starts to be uh, 27 times 27 pixels. And then you get something like this. And then you combine these patches again to something bigger, and then you get one final output out of, out of it. But when you combine the number of patches, so the input gets laid, or gets smaller for everyone. So here it's the smallest, at the end it's the biggest. Um, but the number of suitable things or suitable formation is it's quite small. Um, so pre-training achieves two things. It makes optimization easier. So when you have a really deep network, you you had the problem that when you compute the gradient, that the gradient vanishes when you have a deep network. So let's say you have a depth of five, then one link in the beginning, so one weight in the beginning did not really make any difference for the output and your, your network is not learning anything. And it also reduces overfitting. Pre-training is not required to make optimization work if you have enough data. So mainly due to a better understanding how analyzation works. So when you read older papers, they are all about pre-training and then people focus more on how, why, why is not supervised training not working. But pre-training is claimed to be still really effective on small data sets. And if you want to have more information, there's uh, another YouTube video where I think Hinton again talks on that. So <coughs> what is pre-training, when to use it. But when you have large data sets, you don't need to do it. Okay, this is so much on outer encoders and pre-training. Questions on that on the theory side? So to the small data set, I mean, usually in the situation where you have a small data set labeled and then you have mm -hmm. large data set unlabeled, so it would make sense then if you pre-set up your hidden layers on the unlabeled and then try and model on the labeled, is it right? Mm -hmm. Correct. I mean, it's similar to do what we do with word embeddings. So word embeddings are kind of similar to outer encoders. So you have a word or a context and you try to predict the word or you have a word and try to predict the context in the script gram model, which is also working on unlabeled data. And this can significantly boost your, your network. But when you use word embeddings as first layer, I would not recommend that you go into the hassle with um, pre-training your network. Have you tried it? Yeah, I, I tried it. There's awesome implementation in 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 the GitHub. It's on MNIST. Um, I tried to implement it and I failed, so it does not produce better results. Um, let me check. So how, how does it look in, in principle? So here we can define the hidden layers. So we say it start with like the size of it and then we go to 500 and then we go to two, two dimensional and we do it by defining a sequential model and we have an encoder where we use the dense function with activation function, the tangents and we have a decoder where here output and input domains are flipped. So we go from 784 to 500 and then for the decoder from 500 to 784. And then there's an autoencoder function in Keras where we say, okay, we have an autoencoder. We say we have an encoder, we have a decoder. We can define our optimizer either stochastic gradient descent or the Adam function. 
and then we train well called fit to train the model so we give our input is a x our output our labels is also the x matrix we have some batch size we have some number of iterations and we do it in an iterative way so train layer by layer and then we can also do an end-to-end -end autoencoder training so for our encoder for every encoder we have a matrix with all the encoders we ought add all the encoder to our model and then we go in a reversed order through decoders add all decoders to our sequential model and then we train our full outer encoder end to end and we can do that and here I have uh, the wrong plot there was okay I didn't run this again or not on the next version but it gives you like a nice plot of it where you can okay some distinction uh, between the different layers so here I used a different activation function which gives you a not really bad plot if you run it with I think tangents function it gives you a much nicer plot so this is on a rectifier linear unit it's not really not looking so good on a rectifier linear unit when you use it on the tangent function it gives you a nice plot where you can see the difference in it it does not really help for the classification task in this setup, so there's somewhere a bug, it's maybe not converging, not enough iterations, batch size too big, too small. I don't know. If someone figures out, please inform me when you say, okay, you forgot to do this step. Um, just shoot me an email, so I'm really interested in. But that's in principle how you, you train your autoencoder for it. So it's it's some ma some mess in the code, but it's still, Quite easy. So you define your encoder, your out uh, decoder, find your outer encoder, and just train it. Okay. Next. So why do we care about outer encoders? So there's, um, as mentioned, what we a lot often do is that we have not fixed sized input. So when we do sentence classification or when we document classification, uh, it can be variable in length. And how to deal with the variable length? There are two approaches. One is convolutional approach, the other one are three approaches. And the first one is recursive neural networks, which will be covered this week. And in the next two weeks, we will cover the two other approaches. And there are two papers by Zoha semi supervised recursive autoencoders for predicting sentiment distribution and recursive deep models for semantic compositionality over a sentiment tree bank, which will be covered now. So the idea of an auto recursive autoencoder is that you apply the autoencoder in a recursive step. So here we have a sentence, I walked into a parked car, and we have our word embeddings where we can map every word to some word embeddings, to some dense vector. And in his 2011 paper, um, he, he took two, two words and combine these word embeddings to a single word embedding. So let's say we have 100 dimensional word embeddings and every word is mapped to 100 dimension, dimensional vector. Then you take 200 dimensions as input and map it to one single one, uh, 100 dimensional vector. How could you do that? Any ideas how you could like map 200 dimensions two vectors of 100 dimensions to one vector of 100 dimensions. Yeah, PCA would be hard. PCA would be hard. Um, what we could do is just add them. So you add two, or you do take the average. Normal summation? Normal usual summation? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you could just add it. Um, this is also known as back of words, where you build just the average of all the vectors and then you get 100 dimensional output, mm -hmm. which works really good as a baseline where you do just a weighted average or either do an average over all the 100 dimensional vectors or you do a weighted average using TF-IDF values, which is a baseline. But he presented here a bit smarter way to do it. and. Here it's recursive because we map all the words until we get one single 100 dimensional output for the whole sentence. So this 
vector is presenting all the knowledge in the sentence. And using this 100 dimensional output vector, we can just add a simple softmax classifier and do some predictions. So here he had it on a sentiment task, so where people could vote, oh, sorry, Hux, you rock, T, I understand, or wow, just wow. So where people could express their emotion to the statement. And from this 100 dimensional output vector for the sentence, he could predict what is the distribution. So think people, wow, just wow, or yeah, it's sad, but I understand what you did. Um, so to give you some math, given two Im uh, embeddings, x1 and x2, each with the same length, 100 dimensional, for example, the outer encoder takes these two vectors, these two embeddings, apply it to uh, multiply it with a weight matrix W and add a bias vector B. So W and B is something which you learn into uh, which you learn during your training process. And this function is like repeated recursively until you get a single output for for your sentence. So and how do you get W and how do you get B? So it's basically an outer encoder, you have your input x1, x2, you compress it from 200 dimensions to 100 dimensions, multiply it with the weight matrix and the bias matrix vector, then you try to reconstruct your two input embeddings, and this is a step you can learn with an outer encoder, so you input just different pairs of words, uh, and learn this weight matrix W and this bias vector B. And the idea is that this you try to do this compression uh, with, or well, you try to reduce the loss, the velocity of this compression. So you try to keep in this vector as much, much information as possible about these two words. And so you can think of like we what we want here. We want to have in the final vector as much as information as for s we have in the sentence, so we do not want like to get an arbitrary, strange information, but we want to keep like the most important information of the sentence in our final embedding. And that's what you can do with an outer encoder. The outer encoder forces that you get this 100 dimensional output contains as much as information as these 600 dimensional input. Yeah, question. Mm -hmm. so, have a, a mm -hmm. um, so here it's right to uh, left, right to left. You can also go left to right. Um, so here it's just for presentation purposes. In his 2010 paper, 11 paper, he he did a greedy approach where he optimized also how the tree is constructed so that the reconstruction error is as small as possible. So he tried here all combinations or graph structures and see what is the output and to make the output as good as possible for reconstructing the input. In his later paper, um, he we or you can define any tree structure, in his later paper he uses a syntax tree. So he uses path tree and then went along the path links, the dependency links to, to do combination of words. Um, using a path tree has the advantage that you can get really sound linguistic information into into your tree structure. Disadvantage is that you need a path tree. And also advantage of a path tree is 
that you can do annotation for the labels. So what he did on his paper, he, he annotated positive or negative. So he took for two pairs are uh, these two words or is this phrase, positive phrase or negative phrase, and then already trained the classifier on the phrase level and not on the sentence level. So you can see, I don't know, this was not a good movie. Good movie would be like positive, not a good movie would be negative. And then the function, this tree can learn, okay, how does negation work in a past tree? Um, and yet, as the last layer, we can just use the softmax function. So we have our our output and then use a softmax function and you do, can do any classification task on this and it works really well on differently sized sentences, also on quite complex tasks. So sentiment is the most common task where we try where you try um, this approach. Questions on that? So I think there's no direct implementation in Keras for it. There is a Java implementation from Zoha, which implements the recursive neural tensor networks, how we call it. Uh, but I haven't tried it. But if you have some some sentence classification task, it's, uh, it's a model I would consider, and which also gives you state-of-the-art results, um, which is really nice to train and to use but a bit complicated from my perspective to implement it from scratch because you have this recursive thing and the uh, maybe pass level annotation thing, so it's or phrase level, sorry, phrase level annotation thing, which is not so easy to do. Basically, you would take like each production, you would parse the, the whole corpus, the each production rule, you know, starting from the leaves, from mm -hmm. the just joining them and doing the autoencoder for each of them. Correct. You wouldn't know it's some limit, well, some limit number that's still huge, but yeah. basically that's it, and then you get a, well, how do you apply them? Uh, I mean, you learn uh, the weight, metrics of place for each pair of words or each mm -hmm. pair of embeddings. Yeah. yeah. And then you just add your softmax classifier with, like, hidden layer with a softmax classifier on it. So what's interesting to note is that we have some weight sharing. So for every combination, we use the same weight matrix W. So it, you do not define for every word combination a new weight matrix or like when you merge in the tree some intermediate representation, but you use the same weight matrix for all, um, for all the words, for all the combinations, which is also an important twist here. Yeah. So this is like outing, uh, recursive autoencoders, really nice model. Um, really also look into the papers of Zoha, they are, I think, quite easy to understand, quite easy to read. And you can use it for like a lot of different tasks, as you've seen with the co-reference resolution, where we use the same structure as for named entity recognition and part of speech. You can use this for all sentence classification tasks. Now I'm going to talk about dropout in neural networks, and I watched, stole the idea from Hinton in his lecture he gave. You can find it on YouTube, and if you want to have more scientifically results on it, um, look at this 2014 paper, Dropout, a simple way to prevent neural networks from overfitting. So ensemble learning. So who knows what is ensemble learning? You want to explain it? Yeah. Yeah, so basically ensemble learning is when you have, like, instead of training one classifier, you get several classifiers, and um, you notify, so it, it depends on the method, but basically you train several classifiers on your data by notifying the classifiers or your data a little bit, and then you combine the results from those classifiers using some weights, and you have another, as far as I understand, you have another meta classifier that uses ways from those classifiers to produce final class table. Yeah. So you can use a meta classifier or you can just compute the geometric average. 
And idea is you create as many different models as possible and you combine them at test time and you average over the different models and this gives you a very effective method against overfitting because your one system, your one naive base classifier maybe overfits but your support vector machine does not overfit on some things and there's one model called random forest it's so it uses uh, decision trees decision tree is like a really bad model it's not typically working so good but in a random forest you initialize for example 100 or 1000 different decision trees and you average over the output of your 1000 decision trees and random forest works really really well so there are a lot of competitions so for example the netflix competition which tries to predict which movie would you like to watch next, which is like a good movie recommendation, really big data set, and was won by Random Forest. And when you go into the data science community, you see that a lot of people win competitions with Random Forest. And the trick is, okay, you have like really bad, simple classifier decision trees, which is easy to train. But when you combine a big bunch of them, you get a really good predictive model. So it's like swarm intelligence, which we use here. So use a lot of classifiers which are stupid but as a swarm they are quite intelligent and give you really good results so uh, what would be great to have this also neural network so we would like to do massive model averaging so we would average over I don't know uh, maybe we start with 100 different neural networks or even like could also imagine that we average over 10,000 different neural networks where we train on it and we hope, okay, when we take 100,000 different neural network models into account and average all of them, that we get like really awesome results. Problem is that each network takes a long time to train. So, I mean, when you try the experiments, even on small data sets, on simple examples as hand flash and digit recognition, you see it takes really long time. And we don't have enough time to learn so many models. So no one wants to train 100,000 models. And at test time, of course, we do not want to compute 100, the output of 100,000 neural network models and do the average. So we need something that is more efficient. And we use dropouts for that, which is like from a mathematical point, really crazy, but a really beautiful idea. So what is a dropout? Um, each time you present a training example, we drop out, for example, 50% of the hidden units you can also change it to other numbers, 10%, 90%, um, but 50%, so you have like flip a coin, should this model, uh, should the hidden layer, the hidden neuron stay in the network. And in a normal fully connected feed forward network, it would look like something like this. So you have here your three hidden layers and it's fully connected. And then you have your output here. And after applying dropout, you go in every layer and arbitrarily chose with a 50 per chance, okay, you should live or you should die. So here we say these two models, we set it to zero, taking it out of the norm model. So when the value of a neuron is zero, apply zero times the weight, so it does not have any effect. And you do it for every layer. And our final model would look like this. So here we, we deleted two nodes, so we have some connections here. And then we have some connections here and some connections here. And when you do the math, you get the crazy number that you randomly sample over 200 at 2 to the power of h different architectures. And h is the number of hidden units. So when you have like 100 hidden units in your model, and so there are 2 to the h, so 2 to the power of 100 different architectures. And what's important, all architectures share the same weight. So this is like the idea of dropout. So what's really crazy is when you have like H hidden units, you sample from two to the H different models. Every model gets few, or only few of the models get ever trained. So two to, two to the 100 is a really large number. It's extremely large. And every model we train is only one, get one training example. Um, but sharing the weights means also that every model is strongly regularized. So it's it's much better than L1 and L2 regularization, which pulls weights towards zero. Um, so 
dropout pulls the weights towards what other model needs and the weights are pulled towards more sensible values. So L1 and L2 regularization, to give you some background on that, so you ensure that the weights get not too large because when the weights gets too large, your model overfits. So for example, for handwritten digit recognition, it detects that the pixel at the lower left corner is like really important to predict an eight because in your training time, there was a single or this pixel was only active once and it was an eight. And so your model thinks, okay, when this pixel is on, it's always an eight, which is of course garbage and where you fail in test time because of overfitting. So you ensure it usually with L1 and L2 regularization with that, uh, that it's not overfitting, but um, using dropout is like more, more suitable to, to, to ensure that overfitting is not working or not, not happening. <coughs> so at test time, we could sample many different architectures and average the output. So we could, I don't know, use dropout several times and then we get different combinations of our hidden units and then get the output and average them. But instead for test time, we use all hidden units and half the outgoing weights. And what's really, really crazy is that it computes the geometric mean of the prediction of all two to the H models. So when you have 100 hidden units, you get predictions from two to the H models. So two to the power of 100 models, which is like trillion. So you get the prediction of trillion different models and you have to do the geometric mean. And we can either use a dropout rate of P0.5 uh, if you do use a different dropout rate, uh, you multiply the weights by one minus P. And you use you can use this really simple trick, and you get like the output of really different a lot of different uh, models. For the input layer, you could also apply the dropout for the input layer, but the probability should be smaller than 0 0.5. This is known as denoising autoencoder, which is a bit older model, but people nowadays only apply it for. Um, for the hidden layers, and there's also no implementation in Chaos where you could drop out some of the input units. Questions on that? Can you go back to this previous slide? This one? Uh, where we had, um, yes, two to eight. So we have sample over two to eight different architectures, but it's less than two to eight, right? Sorry, say again. Our sample size yeah. uh, is less than this explanation. Okay. So when you drop out 50% of your hidden layers, you could think of you get two to the H different networks because this is one <coughs> network architecture and then you, I don't know, in the next run you drop out other layers and you, it creates a different architectural layer. And there are two to the H different architectural layers when you use like a dropout of 50%. So there are like two to the eight different possibilities how your network, how the connections could look like when you use dropout 50%. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. And when you use this, you, it's the same as you do compute the geometric mean of two to the eight different models. So mm -hmm. it's the same as if you would compute or train two to the eight different neural networks from scratch like mm -hmm. this and then do a geometric mean for the output. Yes. Okay. So how well does a drop work out work? So this is the classification error on the MNIST data set. And with drop out, we get an error, which is, I don't know, uh, 1.6 without drop out. And with drop out, it decreases to like 1.1. So which is quite quite big. Other architectures, other papers report on that they get, for example, for the F, for the sentiment uh, prediction is a sentence positive or negative in sentiment, uh, that the accuracy increases by two, uh, up to 4% in accuracy. So it increases from, for example, 70% uh, accuracy to 74% accuracy, just using adding a dropout layer. 
the first one, the, the no dropout is regularized or, or I think it's regularized, okay. but for details. Yeah. I think the first one is regularized. So. So it's easy to implement. There's one one command in Keras where you can just add a dropout. So it looks something like this. So you have your dense model, and then you can just say you add a dropout. So you have your dense model, and then you add a dropout of 0 0.5 probability, and that's how you get your dropout layer into your network and which makes it pr or prevents overfitting and increases your QC. So the recommendation by Hinton in his lecture was if your deep neural <coughs> network is significantly overfitting, dropout will reduce the number of errors a lot. So if you, you fail due to overfitting, you try a dropout layer. And he also recommends if your deep neural network is not overfitting, you should be using a bigger one. So add more hin layers at and increase it and increase even more hin layers and increase even more hin layers until it overfits. And then you can add um, a dropout for it. And the theory is that, for example, in our brains, we have a lot of m more parameters than experiences. So we have a lot of synapses in our brain so many million trillion synapses in our brain, but we have only a quite number of experiences. So we, the, the, our lifetime on Earth is quite limited, and we have a lot more um, synapses in our brain than we have lifetime. So it seems when you look at the brain that it makes more sense to have more parameters and to try to increase the experiences. So you can also try that that you go not from like like the bottleneck where you go in the outer encoder from a big layer to a smaller layer, but where you go from the input layer to even a bigger layer. So let's say you start with 500 dimensional input and then you go to 1000 dimension, but you add some dropout to it. Another way to, drink, uh, to think about dropout, so in a fully connected neural network, he, every uh, hidden unit knows which other hidden units are present. So the hidden unit can co-adapt with them for the training data, but this creates big complex uh, connections between and they are not robust. So it's like really, really complex. They learn like really, really complex rules to, to work well on the training data. And of course, at test time, they fail because the environment changed. In the dropout scenario, each unit has to work with different set of coworkers. So the hidden layer does not know next time which are like my coworkers and they cannot co-adapt co to the co-workers. So it will force the hin layer that every unit, every neuron in your hin layer learns something individually useful, and but still tries to be different from its co-workers to still adapt some value to the new set of hin units which are present. Okay, that's it for today. Any remaining questions? Yes. What does dropout mean is the training data? Um, so will I need more training data or less training data or no? It gives you with the same amount of training data better results or when you put it a different way with you get the same results with the less training data. So here we see the number of of updates, which you can also think of like the size of your training data. And here we get with the same amount of training data, better results. Further questions? Then, okay, next week we are going to talk about convolutional neural networks, which is also a really easy way to implement a network which works on uh, variable length input, so for example on sentences or on document level, and then in two weeks about long short-term memory, which became and become quite popular, popular in 2015 and 2016. So we are going more to like 
state-of-the-art approaches which I used this year and maybe which I used next year. Okay, thank you very much.